good afternoon all i hope you all had a good lunch and seriously professor mohanty is taking good care of us <laughs> thank you professor mohanty and uh, today in the morning session professor bolton already educate us with different types of uh, noise control measure and what yesterday in yesterday class he discussed us uh, uh, about the different types of absorptic materials and in today's session specifically on the automobile noise control and in my session i am going you to discuss i am going to discuss about the natural material for noise control application and i am in this so in this first i am going to introduce you with different types of natural materials what are the applications of this kind of materials what are the different derivatives how we can manufacture this uh, natural material for different noise control applications what are the manufacturing processes involved in it once we develop those uh, 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 manufacture those materials what are the different tests which we should done on those kind of materials and again we have because here we are developing the material for sound absorption properties as well as the no sound blocking properties so we test those material for acoustical uh, properties of those kind of materials and in the end i am going to discuss i am going to show you two different types of case studies one is on the vacuum cleaner and another was one is on the domestic dryer and where i try to reduce the noise of the vacuum cleaner as well as the domestic dryer and in the end i am going to discuss the future scope of natural material what are the natural other natural material which are available which we can use for noise control applications and what are the problem we are facing while manufacturing those kind of materials so this things i am going to discuss in this presentation so as we all know that noise become the major concerns of our day to days life and this problem worldwide arise due to excessive use of vehicle aircraft industries and the machinery nowadays we are mostly depend on the machinery things so when something vibrate it produce some noise so every day we are facing this kind of problems and we are looking for the solution so how we, uh, what are the solutions are available so principle of noise controls state that we have three different types of solution either source noise control do some design change making some quieter machineries second one is the path noise control using some absorptive materials or the blocking materials reduce the path noise other third one is uh, use the air plug or some air muff kind of things to reduce at your own level so these are the things i am only focusing on the path noise control things how we are going to develop how we can develop the sound absorbing materials as well as the sound blocking materials so professor bolton yesterday in yesterday class he already mentioned these are the sound absorbing materials that is fiberglass is excellent sound absorbing materials as well as polyester fiber polyurethane foams so these are the available trade uh, uh, available sound absorbing materials synthetic materials and as well as for sound blocking materials lead sheet is a very good sound blocking material work as a barrier materials the second is the concrete wall steel sheet so our idea is to develop this kind of material using some natural material you by uh, natural materials so what is the what is the importance of natural materials why we try to shift the technologies from synthetic material to the natural material because nowadays we are looking for the greener technologies so the increase Uh, increasing concern over the problem of climate change and the global warming has has increased impetus for cleaner and greener technologies and we are looking some solution which are biodegradable in nature also so here we develop natural fiber extract from the plant fiber which could be sea cell coir flax hemp so many natural fibers available so these are extracted from the plant fiber and with this plant fiber we can develop some sound absorbing uh, we can develop the Now, uh, so, uh, we can develop the sound absorption material as well as the blocking materials. So presently, I am doing research on different different types of natural material. For 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 this presentation, I concentrate myself only on the jute. So here, I am only presenting the jute as a natural sound absorbing as well as the sound blocking materials. So what is jute? Jute is a natural material which is extracted from the plant fiber. and jute is a lignocellulose uh, uh, lignin cellulose fiber which is composed primarily of the plant material it contains cellulose as well as lignin cellulose is basically the major component of plant fiber and lignin is the uh, the component which comes from the wood fibers so basically it is so 
where come from uh, from where the juice comes from juice is actually the plant and the outer skins of the plant collected that is known as the jute it comes into the category of the bast fiber the bast fiber is basically the fiber collected from the skin skin of the plant so it is uh, it is uh, specific uh, cultivated in larger quantity in the eastern part of india mostly in the west bengal as well as in the bangladesh so once i started my study i 10 year ago i think 9 year back so i only know the use of jute as a gunny bag so people don't know the use potential use of this kind of material as a sound absorbing or noise control application of this kind of uh, material so now after a decade we can say that this this material have a very high potential in in sound absorbing as well as in the area of sound blocking so there are various advantage of jute one is it is a strongest natural fiber good insulator low cost because it is a plant fiber very low very uh, very low cost very cheap i think around rupees 20 per kg it is available in the market renewable in nature 100% biodegradable which uh, because it is a plant fiber and environmental friendly so why we select jute because i already told you jute is a natural eco friendly biodegradable cost effective and we can also develop this kind of material as a self extinguishing uh, material also possible application could be uh, could be very wide like acoustic uh, building acoustics automobiles home appliances noise control hvac machinery enclosure so we will discuss in the case study how this material can help uh, in this kind of possible applications so we estimate the physical and acoustical properties so in later slide i am going to discuss those things so what is inside the jute this is the view of the jute field so this is the jute field this is the photographic image of the jute field and this is the uh, scan under the scanning electron microscopy this is the image under 129 magnification you can see this fibers are randomly oriented irregular fibers so, and rough in uh, rough from the outside so under the 1000 magnification factor so yesterday prof, uh, professor showed us the image of the fiber glass so this is a similar kind of image i am showing you this is a very fine fibers which is very fine fiber irregular randomly oriented fibers so this this is the inside image of the fiber what is inside in this this is a jute strand outer is outer of this strand is the lignin that is the wood fibers as well as the plant fibers cellulose and the hemicellulose things so the motivation behind this kind of study is jute based material have a very high very good potential in noise controlling application such material can also engineered for good fire retardant uh, fire retardant properties and we can improve the structural strength of those kind of material and make it uh, a good sound absorbing as well as good sound blocking materials so jute based material comes in vari various forms like in fibers felt cloth in fiber forms also there are uh, there are there are different uh, variety of fibers like td4 td5 matlab coarse to fine fibers it is known as one of the golden fibers also so finer fibers so we can use those kind of derivatives for different kinds of application purposes so before going into the detail of different test i just want to discuss the characteristics of the jute so first i am going to discuss the fiber size what is the fiber size of the jute fiber porosity air flow resistivity toxicity characteristic lengths because we are developing it as a sound absorbing material we should know this Uh, no uh, we, we should know this type of parameters so here is the fiber size of the jute samples so from this we measure at different different location and average the dime uh, average of diameter at different location so here is the jute fiber diameter is 68 microns density of the jute fiber is quite high that is uh, uh, 1084 kg per meter cube next important parameter is porosity it is uh, professor already discussed what is porosity flow resistivity i am not going into the detail of the terms so porosity it is basically the ratio of volume occupied by air in the material and it can be calculated by using this expression that is density of the jute sample as well as density of the jute fiber so here the jute fiber showing less porosity as well as the jute field so the range comes from 0 to 1 and it is showing good uh, as compared to the jute fiber 
So again air flow resistivity, the acoustic energy which is converted into heat energy by the friction while the sound waves try to move through the tortuous path. For this we use this, uh, we measure the uh, air flow resistivity of the jute felt and the jute fiber and the jute felt air flow resistivity is high as compared to the jute fiber. And this also affect the you know, NRC values of the materials. Torsiosity parameter describe the degrees of the irregular, how much it is irregular in shape, irregularity, irregularities of the porous flow channel. Torsiosity is a measure of the elongation of the passage way through the pores compared to the thickness of the material. So, this is the jute fiber, uh, uh, jute fiber uh, is 1.22 whereas jute felt is 1.05 as the inner structure become more complex and the torsiosity become higher. So, the structure of this uh, jute fiber is more complex as compared to the jute felt. Now, come to the another important property that is the characteristic length. The characteristic, uh, the characteristic length related to the shape of the aperture inside the pores and there are two types of characteristic length. First is viscous characteris uh, characteristic length and second one is the thermal characteristic length. Viscous characteristic length is basically related to the size of the interconnection between the two pores, between, uh, interconnection between the two pores and th second one is the thermal characteristic length. It is related to the diameter of the pore connecting channels. So, here we measure, here we uh, we already, uh, professor already mentioned that we are not able to measure this uh, by the setup. So, we uh, use the empirical relationship and use the Allard model to, to uh, calculate the jute fiber and the jute felt characteristic length. Now, come to the story of the jute. So, this is the basic properties of the jute, characteristic properties of the jute. So, here it is a jute fiber, jute plant. So, this is the jute plant. From this plant, this type of fibers comes. So, this is the jute fiber and single fiber, single strand of the fiber is the, this is the jute strand and from this uh, uh, jute strand, we can develop different types of acoust uh, acoustical materials, jute derivatives. So, here it is a jute fiber, jute felt and the treated jute felt and we can develop the jute composite by this kind of jute felt. So, I show you uh, in the later slide how we can develop the jute composite. So, I already discussed you the uh, with you the advantage of the jute. So, what are the disadvantage of using because every material has some advantage as well as the dis disadvantage. So, here because jute is a water loving hydrophilic in nature, it it is uh, so it is difficult for this uh, material. To, uh, to form a good bonding between fiber and the matrix because of its hydrophilic nature of the jute fiber prevent good adhesion between the matrix and the fiber. So, for that to overcome these things we have to treat the surface with uh, we have to pre-treat the surface so that we can make a good bonding between jute fiber as in uh, jute fiber and the matrix. So, for this we do a number of pre-treatment process have been discovered for improving the interfacial adhesion and thus the, and improving the mechanical strength of the jute composite. So, once it, it uh, once it uh, form a good bonding between the fiber and the matrix ultimately we are going to increase the mechanical strength as well as the we make a good composites. So, for this we do a, uh, we do some pre-treatment of the jute fiber, we wash with the detergent, we do some alkali treatment, cycloethylation. So, these are the different types of uh, pre-treatment processes to improve, uh, to change its hydrophilic nature and improve the good bonding between the fiber and the matrix. So, here it is the alkali treatment of the jute fiber, dipping of the detergent washed. So, basically we dipped into the uh, sodium hydroxide solution for 4 hours and uh, removing the, so what this treatment basically do? It basically remove the portion of the, it basically remove the impurities which is, which is actually available, uh, which is actually present in the jute fiber. We are actually trying to remove those impurities so that we get some space and we make a good bonding between jute fiber and the matrix. I just tell you, uh, show you the SEM image. So, this is basically the untreated fiber. So, this is the untreated. If we treat with 1 percent alkali treatment, you are able to see there is some pores, some things open up. See this is a single strand and it open up again if you do the 2 percent alkali treatment, so more wider space 
नेक्स्ट इफ यू डू द थ्री परसेंट एल्कली ट्रीटमेंट यू यू आर एबल टू सी मोर स्पेसेस बिटवीन द फाइबर्स सो दिस ट्रीटमेंट बेसिकली डू टू रिमूव दिस काइंड ऑफ इम्प्योरिटीज यू आर एबल टू सी दिस काइंड ऑफ दिस इज द इम्प्योरिटीज थिंग्स सो बाई रिमूविंग दिस काइंड ऑफ इम्प्योरिटीज टू मेक अ गुड बॉन्डिंग वी डू दिस काइंड ऑफ एल्कली ट्रीटमेंट टेस्ट another we do the bi axial stress treatment to increase the alignment for better formation of the molecular change increase exposed contact area of the alkali treatment so these are the different different types of the pre treatment test i'm so for this study we opt this kind of test if you want to develop the the composites with different types of material you go through the literature and found, find out what are the test required for your product or your materials so these are the tre treatment so basically this treatment was done by one of the student at our lab manzil i uh, remember the name actually manzil he did this kind of test pre treatment of uh, the jute so he used sodium hydroxide and the alkali treatment of the jute fiber and used the ultraviolet lamps so once he do the pre treatment the, so now he changed the hydrophilic nature of the jute then he developed the composite so this for this for the composite purpose he specifically used the jute fiber and uh, put some resins so he used three layers of the jute fiber uh, jute fiber and this is the hand layer technique so what in the hand layer technique one fiber then by hand you uh, you, you uh, put the resins and then again you put one more fiber uh, fiber layers and then again resins and then fiber again uh, press it under uh, press it for 1 hour so this is the sem image of the jute composite every time whatever we treat we always go for the scanning electron microscopy test this is required because we want to know the how this uh, matrix and the fiber bond together so we want to know the uh, this things so this is the with one treatment we are able to see this is the fiber so this is fiber and this is your matrix you are able to see this there is a space between the fiber and the matrix okay it it shows that there is not a good bonding between the fiber and the matrix again this is uh, after all the treatment uh, this is the fiber and this is the matrix in this we are not able to see any type of gap between the fiber and the matrix so this two images shows that this this particular composite form uh, is a good composite and it forms a good bonding between the fiber and the matrix and it also reflect in the mechanical properties as well in the sound uh, sound uh, blocking properties also stc value of this material also so first treatment is the alkali treatment second treatment is the these are the pre treatment processes he did so he measured the tensile uh, he measured the mechanical and the transmission loss of the, uh, these four composites so he done the tensile test as per the astm and the standard so type 1 so type 1 i showed you that there is a gap between the fiber and the matrix from here you can also see there is a strength of this material is poor as compared to the type 4 type 4 shows the good bonding between the fiber and the matrix again he performed the flexural test i showed you the so this is the overall result of the tensile and the flexural strength since so, type 1 is the alkali treatment type 2 is the uv plus alkali treatment biaxial treatment type 4 so type 4 always shows us the good result because of its bonding so once it form a good bonding between the fiber and the matrix so it shows the good mechanical properties as well as the good sound transmission class values also so these are the test done by manzil and i had pers i had developed for my study the rubber coated jute based composite so this are, uh, this is the procedure of rubber coated jute based composite so for for my study for noise reduction in a home appliances we use this composite we implement this composite so for this we use 400 gsm jute felt we treat with the aqueous chemical that is alkali for 1 hour wash with water to remove the excess chemical so that the pores open up once the pores open it we uh, we treat with very dilute rubber latex here the rubber latex is only used for the bonding purpose so the based on the application purpose uh, where we are we are going to use that composite where we are going to block the the noise so based on the application purpose also we have to develop the composites and we have to choose what manufacturing process we are going to use for this things 
so here we treat with uh, hot pressing we uh, do some hot pressing for 15 minutes and this is our uh, fabricated jute bay, uh, rubber coated jute composite for this we use a 300 ton hydraulic press for the compression uh, purpose so here is the jute field so this is 10 jute field 1 2 3 is, is 10 jute field and when we compressed it we form this kind of composite so this composite is of 5 mm uh, 5 mm thickness composite uh, we fabricate so we develop the composite now every time we are because we have ultimately we have to implement this composite in the industry so every time we have to look for the cost so these are the prototype development cost of the rubber coated jute composite is 150 mm into 150 mm 5 mm thickness the jute composite cost is rupees 15 very cheap material we can it is in very alternative material for noise reduction second is if we develop for 5 percent rubber coated jute composite 250 mm into 250 very uh, it's uh, the cost is around rupees 20 now now we develop the composite now the our ultimate aim is to implement so, if our ultimate aim is to implement, it means it has to interact with the machine. It has to interact with the machine or the environment. So, we have to go through few different mechanical tests, physical tests. So, these are the physical tests which uh, are water absorption test. Why it is required? Because once we implement the composite inside the machine, if it by chance, if it is come in contact with the water, how is uh, what are the performance change uh, change in the performance we have to measure if we do if it come in uh, contact with the uh, humid atmosphere so we have to look into those aspect also swelling in water test biodegradable if our developed composite get attacked by the microorganism so what is the biodegradation rate flammability if it is if by chance it catch fire like in automotive this is a major issue if all of a sudden it's catch fire so what are the rate of the flame propagation we have to look into all the concept of these things thermogravimetry test so i'm not going into the detail of all the test i'm going specifically discuss few test so if you want to look in uh, if you want to go and do this kind of test these are the standard which are available to do this kind of test so because fire is the important properties we have to test to evaluate the fire retardant and develop the material our, develop our material as a fire retardant material so we conduct actually it is five different types of test i mentioned sorry it is five different types of test first one is limiting oxygen test second is flame propagation test smoke density test and thermogravimetry test and last one is ul94 fire test so what is limiting oxygen index test as we all know that in atmosphere 21 percent oxygen present so if something required and we require uh, oxygen for burning so in atmosphere 21 percent oxygen is there and our sample our developed rubber coated jute sample required 30.2 percent oxygen which is quite high so it is not uh, easy for our sample to burn in the atmospheric condition so this is the limiting oxygen test all tests are done at iit khadakpur itself not at our laboratory we use different laboratory for this kind of test second important test is flame propagation test we want to know the rate of the flame propagation so rate of the spread uh, flame propagation and this test is done as per fm vss federal motor vehicle safety systems so the rate of flame propagation of our sample 100 mm sample we burn and see the rate of flame propagation so here it is 9.7 mm millimeter per minute and in between that it self extinguish around 7 times here we use some fire retardant to, uh, to uh, uh, for making it self extinguish, uh, uh, self extinguish next important test is smoke density, uh, smoke density test this test tell us if we burn the sem, uh, sample how much smoke it is going to produce because smokes are toxic in nature we want to know if suddenly catches fire if we implement our material for building a caustic application if it is catches fire so it is going to produce some toxic gases so we want to know the percentage of oxygen if we compare with the fiberglass we did so the smoke density produced by the fiberglass is quite high as compared to the our developed jute based uh, composite 
So here it is a fiberglass that is also developed uh, at dif uh, not at our lab laboratory at different laboratory at IIT Khadakpur. So this is the fiberglass samples. So see how badly it burn and here it is jute based composite. So another important test is thermogravimetry test. We want to know the usable temperature range of this kind of material. Whatever we develop, we want to know the usable temperature range, how much temperature it can sustain. So for determine this, we did this kind of test. So this actually shows the degradation point of the sample as well as the degradation ending point. So the degradation start at 269.3 degrees Celsius. So we find that our uh, samples start degrading at 269.3 degrees. So quite high. Now the another important test is horizontal test that is slow burning on the horizontal sample. So we do without using the fire without treating it with the fire retardant and with with fire retardant. So I am going to play a. See this is the horizontal test. Here we treat our sample with the fire retardant things and we try to burn the sample. You can see it is not catching any fire. <laughs> so we try to burn the sample actually. Because of the fi we fire retardant treatment, it is not. So that is what we are looking for. <laughs> so next we conduct a vertical test. We j just vertically put this sample and burning stop within 10 seconds. So these are the standard. So without the fire retardant, how quickly it started burning. See, so basically we have to develop the material. Whatever the material you choose for the noise control application, you have to make sure that it does not catch fire, it does not attack by the microorganism, everything, every concept you have to sh keep in the mind. See, it totally burn. Again with the fire retardant thing. It does not. It's it self extinguish actually. See, again we are giving. So basically, this is not the material property. We have to develop our material like this if we want to impl implement the material for the noise control application. So. There are different types of material we have to do this kind of test. Now come to the acoustical properties of the jute. So two, two different properties we develop. Uh, uh, first is acoustical normal specific sound absorption coefficient. So here material sound absorption performance have been monitored in terms of noise reduction coefficient. Transmission loss. So I am not going into the detail of this things. Uh, transmission loss. Here we are going to measure the, uh, we are going to give the sound uh, transmission class value which is a single number rating. So this is the experimental setup which, uh, which, uh, which is used for measuring the sound transmission, uh, uh, which is used for measuring the sound absorption properties of the material as well as the transmission loss uh, of, the, uh, of the material. So here it is the experimental setup details. Here we use a speaker, four microphones, location, two, two termination, so analyzer. So we measure the sound pressure at four different location, calculate and solve the matrix using two load conditions and obtain the transmission loss and the absorption properties of the material. Now come to the, proper, uh, now come to the result. Here it is measured sound absorption uh, coefficient of the fiberglass which is our traditional sound absorbing material which shows excellent sound absorbing properties and blue one is our jute felt which shows which is comparative to the fiberglass which is close by to the fiberglass. So we can uh, say that this is also a good sound absorbing material. Pink one is the synthetic cotton. 
we did this uh, we uh, we measured the sound absorption coefficient of few different materials like jute fiber coir wool cotton gypsum board fiberglass jute felt treated jute felt so there are other materials also that i am not discussing so we are doing this research right now and we hope we we come up with more materials for uh, more natural material for sound absorbing and sound blocking uh, materials so here is the transmission loss measure measurement setup as per sa uh, as per sa j1400 standard so earlier we don't have a transmission loss tube so we use this kind of setup for measuring the uh, sound transmission loss so here we measure the sound intensity sample holder so this is the basic setup so with and without the sample we measured the sound transmission loss without the sample and with the jute composite so this is the plot of the transmission loss of fabricated jute composite and basically this is the result of, uh, uh, sound transmission class result of fabricated jute composite 1% 1 uh, 1% uh, rubber treated jute composite showed stc of 38.9 2.5% showed 37.5 so these are the result of the jute if we compare this stc of 12 inch thick concrete shows the st, uh, 53 whereas stc of 6.4 mm steel plate shows 36 so it is quite comparable we can use this kind of material for sound blocking application also so this is study i have done at uh, purdue university under professor bolton so we are interested to know the orient effect of the orientation of fiber also because that also play a important role whether it is normal incidence or the grazing incidence so here we did on the jute felt so we found that grazing shows better result as compared to the normal one and we published the paper also uh, i think professor bolton had presented this paper <laughs> so this is the study we did at purdue now come to the case study so this is our vacuum cleaner so everybody knows that vacuum cleaner produce a lots of noise and every day we get irritated by listening those noise so our idea is to reduce the noise of the vacuum cleaner so here we use a uh, uh, here we uh, try to measure the sound power of a vacuum cleaner by using the sound intensity probe so suppose suppose this is your vacuum cleaner so what we did is we form a grid outside this vacuum cleaner all the surfaces we form the grid and each grid we measure the sound intensity like this so we can measure the sound intensity by using this probe by uh, by scanning process also as well as by using the point measurement process also here we have a very small vacuum cleaner so we use a point point measurement technique but if we have a big uh, uh, big machinery or we you do you want to do the intensity measurement so you prefer uh, scanning we uh, we usually we usually prefer the scanning method because here we can swipe uh, like this we can measure and get the overall picture of the grid so so here we trying to measure the sound power that is the intensity and the area so this is the vacuum cleaner so this is the sound intensity uh, uh, sound intensity of the top surface of the vacuum cleaner we measured with all may uh, we measured all the surfaces of the vacuum cleaner top right of the vacuum cleaner back of the left front so we found that top is showing the higher sound power level 66.5 dba so we try to reduce the sound power of the vacuum cleaner by reducing the top of the vacuum cleaner why it is high because of this blower i am sure you are able to see this because this is the blower things and it is the noisiest we try to rank the source highest noise source professor already discussed the first first target is to find out the highest noise source so this is the identification of noise source in the vacuum cleaner and we found that because of the this uh, blower it is producing high noise so we try to reduce we target this area and try to reduce this 
so what we did is i'll just show you first we tried uh, first what we did is we use a simple cartoon box to reduce the noise of the vacuum cleaner so vacuum vacuum cleaner without enclosure is 67.6 dc uh, dba sound power once we use this cartoon box kind of enclosure enclosure the vacuum cleaner with enclosure is 60.53 we are not able to reduce much noise because this is the cardboard kind of things again we uh, what we did was vacuum cleaner with jute line enclosure inside that enclosure we put a jute line and we reduce around 2 decibel of noise so uh, again what we did was it's vacuum cleaner with jute line enclosure and we use jute dissipative silencer so this is our jute dissipative silencer we this is 300 mm lo uh, long jute dissipative silencer so what we did is we uh, we put the silencer on that uh, blower things and we are able to reduce around 6 decibel of the noise that is quite quite remarkable so this is a spectrum of uh, reduction in sound power of a vacuum cleaner sound power without jute line enclosure you can see that the overall sound power is around 70 60 point something 60 point uh, i think 67 here 67 or here sound power with jute line enclosure and jute dissipative silencer is 57.1 so we are able to reduce the noise by 10 decibel by using the simple very cheap jute uh, muffler so this is very cheap if i calculate the cost of this jute dissipative silencer i'm sure it is not more than 20 rupees so you can think of a vacuum cleaner cost of the vacuum cleaner is in 1000 uh, uh, close to 10000 i think i guess if it is a good quality vacuum cleaner and if you Im implement this kind of technologies i'm sure you all like it <laughs> by adding 20 rupees more you are able to reduce 10 decibel of noise again we did similar kind of study on the domestic dryer so this is a domestic dryer again we use a sound intensity probe to find out the identify the noise source location in the domestic dryer and here noise source identification in the cloth dryer this is the top so this is a color contour pl plot shows us where the noise comes from and so here it is same as for the blower side and here in the back there is a in, uh, motor so be, motor which is used to run the drum so this is the motor highest source so here we have to reduce if look into this things we can say that the top is the noisiest one and back is the noisiest one fine this is 63 this is 63.5 if we reduce the top noise as well as the rear noise we are able to reduce the noise of the domestic dryer so here we open up this things and we try to put the jute composite develop jute composite inside the shell of the domestic dryer and again what we did is at the rear side we put this jute felt jute felt so domestic dryer with no treatment the sound power is 69.4 as well as domestic dryer with rear inner wall having 5 mm jute felt lining is 68.7 and once we use a jute blanket so it is 63.5 so i just please the difference without any treatment and with treatment so if the cost of the domestic dryer is 20000 rupees if you add this kind of material you are able to reduce the 6 decibel of noise which is quite a remarkable thing and i have seen one ad so a, a baby is uh, sleeping next to the washing machine i hope you all so this kind of things people are looking for 
because we are living in a dwellings where vacuum cleaner, refrigerator, everything is very close by. So, it is producing lots of noise. We, we have to look into these things. So, this is the octave band spectra of the radiated sound power of the dryer. Without treatment, the red one shows the without treatment and here with treatment, we are able to reduce the sound power. So, here there are different application of developed jute material for noise control application. We develop different types of jute material for noise control application in forms of sound absorption, sound absorbing materials, blocking materials and we can reduce the noise of the, uh, we can uh, reduce the noise of the uh, engine by making this kind of jute based enclosure. We can develop the jute based enclosure as well as uh, in the machine, inside the machine we can implement this kind of technology and reduce the noise of the machine. In office, we, we, in office partition, we can also use this kind of material for reducing the noise of the, for, for noise reduction purpose. At our laboratory also, we remove this cellotex board and change this with the acoustical ceiling and try to reduce the noise of the, uh, try to change the reverberation time of this uh, by using this kind of material. So, there are lots of scope of this kind of material we can develop. There are other materials also we can look into those materials, we can develop those material for noise control application. So, basically you have to develop, it is not like that readily available materials are there. So, you have to develop the material as per the applications and look into those things. And one more important aspect I forget to tell you that uh, you have to look into the life of the material also. Because here we are lo looking for the solution for machi machinery noise control or building acoustics. So, we have to look for the material and the life also. So, how long your material is going to stay? If the life of the material is for 5 years or 2 years, so there is no use. So, you have to increase the life of the material. If your washing machine or the home appliances is stayed for 10 years, so you have to uh, to look for the material and develop the material so that the, the developed material can also stay for 10 years. It does not last within 3 years. So, these are the things we have to look as a noise control engineer. So, we develop this technologies in, uh, in, in one of the industry and try to reduce the noise, uh, noise and we remarkably reduce in one of the home appliances by around 5 decibel that uh, I think Professor Monty is going to discuss in next session. So, area to be explored other than jute, there are lots of eco friendly materials like coir, hemp, etc. For noise control application, explore the factor which are responsible in engineering those natural material for noise control and optimize those things. Here I optimize the sound, uh, sound blocking material. We treat with 1% rubber, second uh, 2 percent rubber, 3 percent rubber, 5 percent rubber and parallelly I am looking into the result of sound transmission class, what happening with the transmission class. If I am going to increase the rubber content, whether it is going to affect the sound transmission class value or not. So, ultimately we found that uh, 5 percent is the optimum, optimum percentage of rubber we require to, to make the composite. So, we do not have to go for further treatment of uh, those kind of things. So, whatever you fabricate, you look back and find out whether you are do, doing going into in a right way or wrong way, what are the treatment you are doing, always go and find out through the SEM uh, uh, scanning electron microscopy test and find out whatever the treatment you are doing, actually it is form a bonding, a good bonding between the, the matrix and the filler or not. So, this is the things we have to go back and check every time. This is very cost effective solution. Compared to the traditional noise control material, I, I, I do not know the exact price of the fiberglass, but uh, I am sure that is costlier. Yes, it is as well as fiberglass has helped a hazard, yes also, yeah. So, this is the solution where natural things are involved and we are not harming the integrated, we can develop the integrated combo material also by using this composite as well as the blocking material form a sandwich kind of things and use for different application purposes. So, jute have very wide potential, uh, have actually a good potential for noise control uh, application. We can make the composite as well as we can use for the sound absorbing things also. 
साउंड क्वालिटी इंप्रूवमेंट येस्टरडे स्नेहा ऑलरेडी डिस्कस दिस थिंग्स सो समाइम वी आर नॉट एबल टू रिड्यूज द नॉइस बट इवन इट कुड ऑल्सो हेल्प इन द साउंड क्वालिटी थिंग्स ऑल्सो वंस वी इम्प्लीमेंट द थिंग्स डू इन साइड द मशीनरी वी आर एबल टू फाइंड वी आर वी आर एक्चुअली फाइंड वी एक्चुअली फाइंड दैट द साउंड क्वालिटी पैरामीटर ऑल्सो इम्प्रूव बाई इम्प्लीमेंटिंग दिस काइंड ऑफ टेक्नोलॉजी I think I am before that. So I am ready for the questions. So for that, you have to develop. Uh, you have to develop. Repeat the test. Repeat the composite uh, again and again, and check those things. so it's not like that in one shot you assure that this is the 5 mm thickness and again you are going to make the same sample and it is this thing so okay. you have to estimate the procedure right now i don't think we are thinking about the distribution of fibers in the composite no so we will not get repeatedly we will get because we are getting the sample from 400 gsm jute felt so in market it is like uh, it is available like 400 gsm jute felt so we are cutting the sample from the same sheet and we are using the 10 sheet so like this we are actually trying to make the uniformity while manufacturing the jute based composite it's not like the one sheet i cut it from the 400 gsm jute felt and another sheet i cut it from the 600 gsm jute felt and next time making from the 200 gsm so we are actually trying to maintain the uniformity by making our process in a same way domestic dry <laughs> so, yeah, but whatever. Anyway, um, uh, so welcome back for the after afternoon, uh, and uh, going to be uh, spending some time here talking about building acoustics. Uh, this is using uh, material kindly provided by uh, the local uh, team here. Um, I, I, I traded this lecture for the vibration lecture up front, so I don't have my own material for this one. But uh, we'll uh, talk about some things here. But then I would like to uh, show you, if there is some time at the end, uh, a present, uh, let's say, a little case study involving uh, some building acoustic stuff that we did uh, in conjunction with the Smithsonian Institute in Washington, D.C. But in the meantime. Uh, so, outline of this presentation, uh, things having to do with room acoustics, specifically uh, reverberation time uh, and uh, speech quality. So, we'll talk a little bit about some of the things that influence that, uh, as well as uh, showing some measurements that are similar to some things that we saw in the last presentation, uh, but focusing a little bit on how the measurements for the absorption coefficient are done. Uh, and then uh, some experimental results and some conclusions. Uh, something we will also talk about are uh, required noise criteria, um, but let's get, so reptile speech intelligibility, but let's get going. Um, the uh, title here recommended NC values for various environments. So NC stands for noise criteria uh, here. Uh, and this kind of specification has to do with uh, specifying ex acceptable background noise levels in particular spaces uh, where the background noise level depends on, or the acceptable background noise level depends on the use of the space. And you'll see uh, that there are a whole bunch of things here running from factories uh, down to cinemas, theater, concert, and opera halls. So before we look at that in detail, let's uh, look at this plot, uh, which is uh, the, the so-called NC curves, the noise criterion curves, <coughs> which uh, you'll see are a little bit like the A weighting curves that we saw uh, earlier, I think, where uh, they're relatively high at low frequencies, right? This is down at 63 hertz. Uh, but falling at high uh, frequencies, which um, is simply an indication of the fact that we, we humans uh, are not so sensitive to very low frequency sound. 
so that in principle relatively high levels of low frequency background noise are okay uh, because we simply don't perceive it as, as effectively as we do sound in the 1000 to 4000 hertz range. <coughs> so uh, how, you, how you do an estimate of the noise criterion in a particular space is to use microphones, one or more microphones, to measure uh, the space average background noise in a space like this. That is, you would get rid of all the people, uh, everything that makes noise, uh, set, up, set up the microphones in this space uh, under what you would consider, I guess, to be normal conditions, quote unquote, daytime, nighttime, or whenever the space is meant to be used, uh, and then record some data look at the, uh, I guess, full octave band sound levels uh, simply of the background noise and then plot those on this curve or plot, that, uh, plot them on this page, I should say. Uh, and although I'm not an expert at this, somebody can correct me if I'm wrong, but I think uh, you have to fit under one of these curves uh, to qualify as an NC30 space. So the background noise has to be something like that uh, to be NC30. Uh, but going back here, <coughs> you can see uh, that uh, some spaces are judged to be less, let's say, less sensitive to noise uh, than other places, department stores and shops, restaurant bars, cafeterias and canteens, 35 to 45. Whereas in uh, its kind of common uh, knowledge that in spaces that are meant for performance, you know, classical performance in particular, you would like the background noise levels to be very low uh, uh, so that the details of the performance can be heard and understood. Uh, and that is certainly true in recording, broadcasting and recording studios creeping in here at the bottom. Uh, where any uh, outside noise tends to be particularly noticeable and disturbing on top of whatever else is uh, happening. So, uh, and of course, the cost, you know, I hate to dwell on practical things, but uh, of course, the cost of achieving a certain background noise level like that sort of goes up more or less exponentially as the noise criteria curve goes down, right? Um, but in concert halls, uh, typically the main performance space is uh, a, a, well, in really good concert halls, the uh, performance space is in, a, let's say, a separate building than the outside part of the structure, sitting on its own foundations and probably on spring mounts so that the whole uh, performing space is isolated from the outside uh, world to try to ensure uh, good resistance to ground vibration, for example, uh, vibration transmitting through the ground. So this is one important issue in <coughs> uh, building acoustics, that if you're building a building for or a, a space for a particular use, you have to be aware of trying to get the background noise levels into an acceptable region uh, where the occupants will find it uh, reasonably comfortable. This, uh, there's some uh, data here from a uh, room that was used uh, locally to make some measurements on uh, felt, I guess, the jute felt, uh, that was used as, let's say, a small reverberation room. Uh, this room, six meters by 2.5 by 1.5. Um, hard floor having sort of ceiling, has gypsum-based acoustical boards. Uh, Da, 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 da. So this uh, space, yeah, you'll see, actually was pretty quiet, uh, kind of impressively quiet. Uh, this is the NC20 curve, and the measurements of the full octave uh, background noise levels uh, fall below the NC20 curve. So this is a very good space, actually, for making measurements. You're sure you weren't making this up? Right? No. no, okay. <laughs> Subtract 10 dB from everything. No, uh, 
Okay, so, uh, which is kind of good. Uh, also, what's uh, being demonstrated here is the, um, I guess this is maybe the level reduction, I guess, uh, between uh, inside and out, sorry, inside, which is the dark bars here, and outside, uh, when a noise source was set up exterior to the room <coughs> to ensure that there was good acoustic isolation from outside to inside. Uh, these are one-third octave band levels, and in much of the frequency range, if you take a look at this, there is about a 40 decibel difference uh, between outside and inside, which is uh, kind of good, and as you might expect, thing, the level difference increases as frequency goes up, while at the low end, it's maybe not so big, but... Uh, also, you maybe we were talking a bit uh, this morning about modes of a panel, and I think anyone who's done a bit of vibration stuff will understand that uh, a, sh a shaken finite panel will exhibit modal behavior. So the special will uh, so uh, a variety of nat natural frequencies associated with particular mode shapes that become more complex as the mode number goes up, and also uh, as the frequency increases. Uh, the same thing happens in. Uh, acoustic spaces, partic partic particularly uh, in more or less rectangular spaces like this, uh, where uh, standing waves can form uh, between the floor and the ceiling, between the two walls, and between the front and back. Uh, and so a computation of the natural frequencies associated with that mode, or with those modes, is given here. Uh, and in that space, I guess, uh, the lowest modal frequency was 89.3 hertz, uh, 210, right? So I'm not sure which direction was X, let's see. Uh, so that would be in the long <laughs> direction, I guess. <coughs> um, uh, and so you want to be aware of that, particularly at low frequencies, because it has an impact on where you put microphones, perhaps, because the, uh, if you do have a strong modal response in a space, the experience is that sound pressure levels go up and down more or less uh, significantly. And if you want to make a measurement that's representative of the sound pressure level in the room, you would have to do then significant amounts of spatial averaging to make sure that you get a good smooth value. But uh, something that you can, that is perhaps clear here is that as you go up in frequency, the modes are getting closer together uh, and that uh, once you get above a couple of hundred hertz, there's so many modes per third octave band that you can assume that the sound field is pretty smooth, I would guess, right? Um, some, actually, something <laughs> that we do to amuse people sometimes uh, with our rev room at Herrick, uh, something that demonstrates the modal behavior of the space, uh, is that we use one of our big loud speakers, one of the um, uh, electro voice loud speakers, uh, and position it in the room and tune the frequency uh, such that you get a, a node of the, of the spatial modes uh, right at the location of the diaphragm. Uh, and and why, why that is sort of interesting is that the uh, sound pressure level then is a minimum right at the loudspeaker. Right, and this kind of surprises people because, of course, away from the loudspeaker, the sound pressure level could be very high, and then you stick your head right, <laughs> right beside the uh, loudspeaker, and it's extremely quiet. So it's uh, a little bit startling for people because it d defies common sense, but um, that's acoustics, right? Uh, the uh, a common 
quantifier of the acoustic performance or acoustic quality of a space is uh, the re reverberation time, 0.61 V over A in metric units, uh, which is um, a measure of how long it takes for the sound pressure level to decay by 60 decibels from a steady state value. So if you could imagine running a loudspeaker in this space, running white noise or some sort of noise through it, uh, waiting until the level is constant in this space, and then turning off the signal, letting the sound pressure decay, <coughs> and then looking at the time that it takes for it to fall by 60 decibels, then that time from turn off to minus 60 dB is the rev time. And typically, it's on the order of seconds or some fraction of a second to multiple seconds. Uh, and we'll talk a little bit about what's acceptable uh, in a particular space. But the, um, uh, the reverberation time depends on the volume of the space, right? Because sound is decaying, because sound is interacting with absorbing surfaces in the space. <coughs> and the bigger the space, the longer the time between interactions with the various surfaces, and so the longer it takes for song to sound to decay. By the same token, so the formula that I gave you, 0 0.161 V over A, so the rev time is proportional to the volume, and it's inversely proportional to this thing A, which has to do with the total absorption area uh, of, this, of the surfaces in the room. And logically enough, uh, if the absorption is higher each time it hits, the, as the sound hits one of the walls, a greater fraction is going to be absorbed, and so the sound decays faster. So you can control the rev, so it's very, in a sense, very easy to control the reverberation time in a space uh, because it just has to do with these two things, the volume and the uh, absorption area uh, in, the, in the interior of the space. But uh, as, as, we, as we know, let's talk about money again, uh, because volume, volume translates into expense if you're building a building. Uh, and so it often uh, turns out that there's a kind of push between architects and the, well, the acoustics people and whoever is paying for the, the hall, uh, because the acoustics folks would like to make sure that the volume hits uh, certain targets uh, to ensure that the acoustic properties are good, but the, uh, each additional cubic meter uh, costs a bit of money. Um, not quite sure what the slide was meant to be, but uh, let's uh, talk for a moment about what are good rev times. The uh, rev t reverberation time is um, a kind of issue. Um, let's talk about speech intelligibility, first of all. So uh, we talked the other day, and forgive me if this applies primarily to English, about the structure of uh, spoken language, which has vowel sounds and uh, consonant sounds, which mark transitions between vowels. and and give speech its intelligibility. So if, um, if you say something, uh, the listener needs to be able to hear uh, those, uh, those, the various structural elements to understand what you're saying. And as Senna was talking about the other day, there can be masking uh, produced by noise. So if one noise is superimposed over another, <laughs> it can mask uh, the, the quantity that you're trying to hear. So if, um, if the reverberation time is too long, what happens is that your speech begins to mask itself. Uh, that is, you say something and the reverberation, the additional reflections and things are coming in and, par and covering up what you're saying now with what you were saying just seconds ago, as it were, right? So you're sort of covering up your own speech, uh, which has the effect of making the speech unintelligible. And perhaps, um, I'm not sure if you've had this experience, but if you're in 
a very good reverberation room, for example, or in, uh, in Europe, some big cathedral or something, and you're standing some distance away, uh, it's sometimes very difficult to have a conversation at distances of more than a couple of meters uh, because of this effect where there's so much reflection that things become very confused and you can't uh, understand what the speech is saying. So um, that means uh, typically that if you want to design a room for speech, that the reverberation time should generally be less than a second, right? So I, th I forget the exact, I'm making up some numbers here, but like 0.8 seconds or something for good speech intelligibility in a lecture environment like this. <coughs> then that sometimes is a bit of an issue with very big lecture theaters, for example, where the volume gets pretty big. Uh, for, if you think about music, uh, for example, uh, at least, and again, thinking of Western orchestral music, it's a little bit like language in the sense that there are extended sounds and there are percussion sounds that are breaking things up. And so if you're going to understand the complete piece of music, you have to, uh, under, you have to be able to understand the structure of the piece. And again, if the rev time is too long, the music begins to mask itself. So to be, but the syllable length, quote unquote, in music tends to be longer than in speech. Uh, and so ex good uh, reverberation time for orchestral performances tends to be somewhere around 1.5 to 1.7 seconds. So maybe about twice uh, that for speech. And somewhere in between acceptable rev times for uh, vocal performances uh, tend to be sort of in the middle of those two, so maybe about 1.1 or 1.2 uh, seconds for the rev time. So each of these things uh, requires a certain, you know, if you're going to design a space, you, un you should understand what the application is and what you're intending to do in that space uh, before you start fixing things like volume and stuff, because it's hard <laughs> it's sort of hard after the event to make something bigger. You can always you can always make it smaller, but uh, not so easy to make it big. So uh, back to uh, the local situation here in uh, for a moment. Uh, the interest here was to measure the absorption performance of the jute felt. Uh, which is on the floor here, so the uh, sort of tan-colored surface, right? Uh, so the noise source uh, is shown here, and the recording microphone, I guess, is uh, this guy, the sound level meter, and things are running under control of the uh, computer here. Um, and so in principle, what you do is run some noise through the source uh, while making measurements with the sound level meter, switch off the source, uh, and look at the decay rate uh, filtered through octaves or third octaves uh, to get the decay rate as a function of frequency. And if you can do that, uh, then if you make a measurement uh, with an empty space and then with the absorbent in place uh, by considering the difference between the rev time in the, in the two conditions, you can work out what the absorption coefficient of the test uh, sample is. And we'll show some of that later on. But from a predictive point of view, if you want to uh, know what the what this quantity A is that shows up in the um, uh, rev time formula, uh, it is equal to the entire surface area of the space uh, multiplied by the absorption, the average absorption coefficient. And the average normal incidence absorption coefficient of the sort, random incidence absorption coefficient, is let's say the area weighted uh, average of the absorption coefficients of all the various surfaces 
each of which potentially have different absorptions, right? So the ceilings, the walls, the floors, and my favorite, uh, of course, is you, right? Because each one of you absorbs a certain amount of, sp of uh, sound. Do you, do, you, do you know what you are equivalent to? in a predictive sense. So that you, are, you are approximately equivalent to one square meter of empty space. <laughs> so so each, each one of you has an absorption area of about one square meter, right? <laughs> which depends a bit on frequency. But um, anyway, so if you're ever feeling too proud of yourself, consider that from an acoustic point of view, you're, <laughs> you're, you're just a meter of empty space. Uh, <coughs> so if you um, do uh, the sort of simplest way to approach uh, predictions of sound levels in room is through something called energy, energy acoustics, where you do uh, energy balance between uh, sound radiating from a source and the rate at which sound energy is produced uh, by the source the rate at which sound energy is uh, dis disappearing from the space by absorption uh, in, the, in the walls, and the rate at which energy is being stored in the space, and the energy storage, quote unquote, in the space is the sound field, right? <coughs> so you can do this sort of energy balance uh, thing and come up with predictions for uh, sound pressure uh, as a function of time when sound turns on, and the, uh, you see these very typical things of a sort of exponential increase, uh, but approaching an asympto asymptotically approaching a steady state value where you reach the point where the rate of energy coming in is equal to the rate of energy being absorbed uh, at the surface. Uh, and <coughs> so in principle, in a rev time measurement, <coughs> excuse me, you do uh, this business of waiting for steady state and then turn off the sound and then you get uh, a nice exponential decay. Nice, right? Uh, uh, the uh, issues with this kind of measurement though have to do with the existence of modes in the space uh, and sometimes these curves are not, uh, not quite as smooth looking as this, right? Uh, because the uh, sound energy in the room is in truth divided between various families of modes, uh, some of which decay faster than others. Uh, and so this uh, decay can sometimes be a little bit jagged, uh, but tends to smooth out if you do measurements not at one particular location, but more typically at several locations in the space. And I've seen people using arrays of eight microphones distributed through the space to do these kind of measurements. Uh, also, you may see in uh, very high quality acoustics labs that they will have diff so-called diffusers uh, in the space, sort of strange shaped scattering objects which uh, uh, cause, that sort of break up regular patterns in space. And then sometimes these things also <laughs> rotate, right? Uh, so that it has the effect of sort of scrambling the modes and smoothing out the sound field in the space. So there are various ways of achieving nice uh, decay curves. Uh, and so if you uh, do this on a deci, if you if you were to plot this in decibels, uh, this would be a straight line. Uh, of sound pressure level versus time, uh, and then, of course, simply looking at the minus 60 dB point. From a practical point of view and from signal to noise, or for signal to noise concerns, often these measurements are made not over 60 decibels, but over a range of 30 decibels or so, and then simply extrapolated to 60 to give you the uh, full value. Uh, the other uh, thing that needs to be taken into account in, uh, in a room like this from a predictive, now that we're talking about a sort of predictive point of view, uh, is that a sound field, as we've talked about on several occasions, I think, has two components in a space like this. 
One is the direct component, right? So me talking directly to you. Uh, there's a certain amount of sound that leaves my mouth goes straight to you without uh, basically hitting anything. Uh, whereas then there's the component that bounces around the room and uh, arrives at you from all different directions and which has the positive effect of re reinforcing the level, right? So getting the level up. <coughs> and so uh, the sound field in the room, the mean square pressure, uh, is typically expressed in a, in a way like this with the uh, characteristic impedance times the sound power of the source uh, times this term, which is the direct field, uh, because it's proportional to 1 over r squared. So this is, the, in a sense, the inverse square law. And then this component, 4 over a big A here, is the reverberant sound field, which provides, let's say, a sort of background level in the space and the direct field ultimately will sink below that. So um, it's kind of important, uh, I guess, we've kind of discussed this, I think, this morning, that from a, a noise control point of view, uh, if you want to reduce the noise uh, 15 feet away from me, uh, it's important to understand whether that's in the direct field or whether it's in the reverberant field. If it's in the reverberant field, absorption on the wall does a good job. If it's a direct field, you have to put me in a box, right? <laughs> right? Put me in an enclosure uh, to keep me quiet, right? But um, so that's the important implication of this kind of uh, expression. The um, now, circling back to the measurement, uh, I indicated that uh, you could make um, a measurement here, <coughs> excuse me, uh, with the room empty and with the room uh, with a sample. Uh, the T60 uh, here, I guess, is the smaller of the two rev times, which would be with the sample in place. Uh, and then the T prime 60 is with the the rev time with the sample not in place. Uh, and if you know uh, the volume of the space, the speed of sound, you can work out what uh, the product of the area times the average absorption coefficient, which itself is this big A, which shows up in the uh, reverberation time formula. So uh, I said that you could do this uh, so typically, what you would do would be to measure the decay, or to measure the decay, and run it through a set of filters uh, to look at the decay rate on a frequency by frequency basis, uh, which has been done here. So you can see the octave band uh, absorption coefficients from 125 through to 4,000, uh, and these are, let's say, very uh, typical results. Um, uh, in the sense that the absorption coefficient at low frequencies is kind of low uh, because the sample is very thin compared to a wavelength, but as the frequency goes up, uh, the absorption becomes progressively higher as the sample becomes progressively deeper uh, compared to a wavelength. Uh, sorry. There's the, there's the formula that we know already. This, uh, you know, whether this will show up on the quiz or not, I don't know, but uh, <laughs> perhaps you should make note of this. Anyway, and so uh, again, we've seen, uh, I think, this result already, so I won't dwell too long on this, but the, um, the thing I can point out about this is that this is a very, let's say, characteristic absorption curve for uh, not just natural materials, but for general uh, sound absorbing materials, where the absorption coefficient at very low frequencies is, uh, is very low. Uh, for the absorbing material to have any kind of impact, remember the sort of rule of thumb is that it needs to be about a tenth of a wavelength thick, right? And so at 100 hertz, what's the wavelength? 
3.4 meters. So you're looking, you know, that criterion would suggest that you need about 30 centimeters of uh, material to do anything at 100 hertz, right? <coughs> and so uh, people will not normally give you 30 centimeters to work with. Uh, so if you've only got uh, to be at a five centimeters of some, or something, you're not going to be doing very much uh, below 500 hertz. Um, actually, my rule of thumb, for what it's worth, uh, forgive the English units here, but if uh, if you've got a reasonably good sound absorbing material, uh, and if it's an inch thick, uh, you go through, uh, you reach a good absorption coefficient, so approaching one around uh, a thousand hertz, right? And so if you double that, if, you, if you're going uh, 50 millimeters of material, uh, things are kind of good at 500 hertz, uh, 100, 250 hertz, and so on and so forth, right? So that uh, can give you some sort of guidance uh, and typical of fibrous media, the absorption coefficient sort of goes up, uh, reaches a value close to one, and then generally sticks there. Uh, if uh, we were talking earlier this, earlier this afternoon with some folks about sand, uh, sand is, has a relatively low porosity compared to fibrous media. And if, you, if we were measuring sand, you would see the absorption coefficient go up, but then it would come down to maybe 0.6 or 0.7 uh, because of the relatively small open area compared to the fibrous material, which has a porosity very close to one, for example. Uh, anyway, so this is uh, slightly more detail. <coughs> um, uh, earlier this week, I guess maybe yesterday, talking about the acoustic materials, uh, this, uh, the jute, I think, is probably a good example of a reasonably rigid uh, porous material, uh, not so elastic, particularly if it's resonated. But um, little features like this actually are kind of typical of structural uh, resonances in the, uh, in the material. Uh, so there's at least some evidence that it's beha behaving a little bit like an elastic uh, material, but not having a very profound impact on the behavior of the material. Um, I think, uh, so this is really just saying that the uh, absorption coefficient of a material depends on the structure of the material and that high porosities, medium flow resistivities and things are uh, kind of useful. And I think we'll skip that one. Uh, and then there's a bit of a section here on speech intelligibility and I can assure you I'm not an expert on this, but I can make a whole bunch of stuff up, right? <laughs> so, um, uh, the uh, speech intelligible speech transmission uh, index (STI) <coughs> is a way of estimating the degree of intelligibility of speech in an area. So, testing uh, testing a room to see whether it's going to be good for speech communication. Uh, and you do that by measuring this modulation index between the received signal and a source signal. The reason why uh, the signal is modulated is because of an interaction between the direct uh, signal and reflected signals. So if, um, uh, if you just had a continuous tone in free space and I stick the microphone uh, three meters away from me, uh, the tonal level is absolutely constant, right? But as soon as I start adding reflections and, the, and you uh, have some sort of uh, signal a little bit like speech, uh, the reflected signals begin to interfere with the direct signal and what you see at the microphone is that the signal, is going, the signal level is going up and down 
because of the interaction of the direct and reflected. So sometimes it's positively interfering, sometimes it's negatively interfering, and the stronger the reflections, the greater the depth of the interference, right? Uh, and so the modulation transfer function is a way of measuring, let's say, the depth of those interference features uh, as a function of frequency, uh, and simply, and in a way, is a complement or to the reverberation time, because I think uh, you can probably work out the same sort of thing uh, from the rev time, but in this particular uh, type of study, uh, for whatever reason, there's commercial software and hardware available uh, for doing these kind of measurements. <coughs> uh, and these STI here, there are various um, categories, uh, and to be honest, I'm not really very familiar with the numbers, but the um, but I guess the higher the better, <laughs> judging by this, uh, that the, uh, the larger the number, uh, the smaller the modulation, and the easier uh, speech communication will be in the, in the space, right? Uh, so it's actually a pretty simple test to run. You've just got hardware that generates the signals. Uh, something like the on the directional source in the space, microphone on a sound level meter, push the button, uh, and you get the STI numbers, and then you can look them up in various texts uh, to see whether it's uh, the space is acceptable for uh, use. Uh, the other uh, thing that's important, of course, not without uh, reason, is uh, that the speech intelligibility is affected by background noise levels. Um, and also the presence of direct echoes, uh, which can be confusing uh, sometimes. Um, I had the experience once, uh, quite, quite a number of years ago, of uh, in Melbourne, Australia, actually, of seeing a, a ch Chinese opera perform uh, in, um, in a theater that had sort of a curved back wall <coughs> we were th sitting sort of halfway through the f between the stage and the back wall, and there was a lot of uh, sort of relatively rapid percussion, uh, and because of the f uh, sort of focusing effect of the curved back wall, it mm -hmm. became actually very confusing because there was stuff coming from the front as well as direct, uh, distinct echoes coming from the from behind us, so it was a little bit confusing. And you've maybe had the same experience if you have, a, let's say, a bad um, telephone line. Uh, sometimes, maybe it used to be the case with long distance calls, sometimes where there was a significant delay and you could sometimes hear yourself coming back at you, and it becomes very difficult to speak under those uh, circumstances. <coughs> so, you certainly want to make sure that there are no direct echoes. So let me switch to our little case study here. Uh, grandly titled, Improving the Visitor Experience. Um, uh, this was a project done at the National Zoological Park, otherwise the National Zoo in Washington. Uh, in the Great Ape House, uh, and the the Great refers to apes here rather than the, <laughs> rather than the, rather than the house. Um, uh, so gorilla, gorillas and orangutans, uh, right? So if, which are wonderful anyway, great animals. Uh, but uh, you'll see that there was a bit of a problem here. Three uh, M. Sorry to mention them again, but they have a kind of philosoph uh, philosophical, um, philanthropic uh, relationship with the uh, Smithsonian Institute, which runs the, uh, the zoo. Uh, and so 3M were providing, let's say, noise control services uh, free of charge to uh, the zoo. So these, <laughs> these are our friends uh, here. Um, 
And this is a view uh, inside uh, the great ape house um, where uh, you can, maybe it's a little bit hard to see in these pictures, but the floor is uh, ceramic tile. Uh, the windows through which you would take a look at various uh, folks uh, are, of course, perfectly hard. The uh, surfaces up here were all concrete, uh, and this is painted um, hard surface, right? So it's <laughs> with uh, wells and then glass. Uh, so this is sort of like a reverberation room <laughs> uh, in, the, in the space. And the noise issue, of course, was not with these guys, uh, but with humans, right, in this uh, space. Uh, because uh, if you get um, 50 school kids, young uh, kids in a space like this, and they're sort of excited and seeing uh, interesting things, uh, the noise levels can get pretty high. Uh, and so the people who were suffering here were the uh, the people who are volunteering to serve as guides and to explain things. Uh, and so it's difficult for them to communicate in a space like this if the levels are very high and it's just sort of hard work uh, to be in this space. So there, uh, this is a very popular exhibit. There's uh, two million visitors uh, through here each year. Uh, very reflective space that it is fatiguing for the volunteers and staff. Uh, so I uh, did a whole bunch of measurements, um, <laughs> very high-tech measurements, these, uh, because we used balloons as the noise source, right? So puncture a balloon. The, uh, the orangutan loved this. They couldn't figure out what the hell was going on with <laughs> with these humans holding these things and then going right. Uh, so, um, but whatever. So, uh, we measured the rev uh, the rev time in this way in third octave bands, and you can see uh, that this space uh, it's not really very big, but the rev time was very long. Right, it's three seconds. Uh, which is very unusually long for a, a sp any space where you want to do some communication. Uh, so that, anyway, just illustrates the problem. Uh, the other thing, we hung a microphone up uh, uh, sort of in the entrance area at one stage and then just left it uh, for several months uh, running continuously and logging uh, data. Uh, and of course, you can see at night, it's pretty quiet. Uh, but in the daytime, you're reaching peak levels. And I would point out that these are, <laughs> these are five minute LEQs, right? which means the A-weighted level averaged over five minutes, right? uh, which is approaching 80 decibels in spots, which is like industrial, right? <laughs> very high levels. Um, and in fact, from a, a safety at work point of view, this is, uh, I think, if, if you were measuring levels above 80, right, uh, this would be a so-called actionable space where you would, have to, you would have to develop a hearing conservation program and so on and so forth, right? So this is just below the threshold. Uh, where, in a sense, legally, you would be required to do something about the noise levels. <coughs> so very high here. Uh, and if you take a look, <laughs> you, you can tell the guilty party, because if you take a look uh, at the spectrum of the noise uh, that is averaged over time, uh, you see a spectrum that reaches a peak around 1,000 hertz and then goes down, right? So the, the so-called speech range is right in here from 250 or 500 hertz to a few kilohertz. So this is all speech, is the noise, uh, which is also re reinforced uh, by the fact that when the exhibit's closed and no one's there, you see uh, a background noise level like this, uh, whereas when it's occupied, you see this. 
and at the very loudest, the ten loudest intervals, right, we're reaching uh, third octave levels of just about 75 decibels, which is very high, right? Uh, so the need, so the ab ab need for some absorption is kind of obvious, and then the uh, frequency range that we were focusing on uh, was the so-called speech interference range from 500 hertz to 4 kilohertz to try to get the level down in the range where people are communicating. Uh, and so uh, the material that was created to do this is uh, this microperforated uh, element, a little bit, I guess we don't have a better picture of that, but it's an octagonal frame uh, with a microperforated polymer sheet on the front surface and then 50 millimeter airspace behind it uh, with um, uh, with little feet that came, come out with, a, uh, with um, uh, sticky stuff <laughs> that you can uh, attach it to a smooth surface. Uh, so, and each one of these is um, about a foot, forgive the units here, about a foot square. Uh, and the convenience of the shape, of course, is that you can put an array of them together uh, and create a surface of absorbing materials. Uh, and again, hard to see in the pictures, but uh, the area that we covered was that concrete area. Let me just go back a little bit here. Uh, the concrete space uh, between the top of the windows and the beginning of the ceiling and went all the way around the room uh, there. And that added up to about 800 square feet, whatever that is in meters squared. I'm not sure. Uh, but uh, the absorption coefficient of the treatment uh, peaking out around 1,000 hertz or so, uh, so uh, covering the speech interference range. Uh, Ryan, who was the student involved in this, is uh, has also did some uh, theoretical calculations uh, using the software room acoustic software program Ease, uh, if you've heard of that one, and predicted rev times and so on and so forth. Um, the predicted rev time with the space uh, as it was was very close to what we were measuring, so a peak of about three seconds or so. And the prediction with the treatment was that in this uh, frequency range around a kilohertz, we would not quite uh, but reduce the rev time by a factor of two or so. Uh, which has a substantial impact on the uh, perceived quality of the space. Uh, and once the stuff went in, sorry, here's the number. So 67 meters squared of tiles uh, were installed over the concrete sections of the wall uh, and achieved actually kind of good agreement between the measurements and the predictions for the after treatment uh, rev times. And so, a lot of <laughs> profound conclusions here. Lots of visitors, lots of noise, right? People make noise. Um, and did rev time measurements and sound pressure level measurements to quantify the problem. Modeled room to help us understand what the problem was. Uh, came up with this modular microperforated treatment uh, to provide good absorption performance and reduced the rev time uh, by approximately a second. Uh, and uh, so the, the people at the, at the zoo are, you know, the ultimate test is whether the people at the zoo are happy or not. And so the, uh, the volunteers seem to be uh, significantly happier in the space uh, than they used to be. So things are a bit more comfortable, right, for them. So that was that and whatever, yeah. <laughs> was I'm sorry we don't have any of the photographs of the orangutans uh, watching the testing because they really <laughs> they <laughs> were really 
uh, bemused about what these funny people were doing out there. Bang. <laughs> so anyway, so that is uh, a little example of uh, some practical room acoustic stuff. Good. And any questions about that co or comments? Uh, yeah, th so that's uh, actually what this uh, is showing, right? So we've got uh, the model prediction stuff is green. The measured after is like this. And I think this is the comparison between the rev times measured before and the rev times measured after. So we had a significant impact uh, on the space. Manish. Sir, suppose I want to alter the interior vessel time of this, I mean this studio. Mm -hmm. The most of the feeling is all over the place. Yep. So, how many styles should I change? I mean, should minimum number of that to make, a, make some effect? Uh, well, uh, so you want to, you know, the question is how, uh, how much do you have to add to have a significant impact on the space? And maybe the way to think about that is that you've got to, um, it's an area issue, right? So if, uh, if you've got to uh, make it up.